Welcome back to the next video, everybody. Today, we're gonna to look at a key example of a Galois representation that we'll need called the cyclotomic character. And then we're gonna look at some basic overall properties of Galois representations that we're gonna to need to state some big theorems regarding Fermat's last theorem. So recall from last video, a two-dimensional Galois representation over a topological ring A is a continuous group homomorphism row from the absolute Galois group of Q to GL2 of A. Its residual representation is the natural map, which we call row bar from GQ to GL2 of K sub A, where K sub A is the residue field of A, which is, uh, which so KA is A mod its unique maximal ideal MA. And what is this map? It's row composed with the natural entry wise reduction map from GL2 of A to GL2 of KA. Okay, here's a key example of a one dimensional uh, Galois representation. It's called the cyclotomic character. Let's let P be a prime. Let's let Z P cross denote the group of units in the P adic integer Z sub P. Z sub P is the inverse limit over N of Z mod P to the N Z. Uh, see last video for a quick explanation on inverse limits. What are the transition maps here that we're taking the inverse limit over? Well, there's definitely a natural map from Z mod P to the N Z to Z mod P to the M Z if N is bigger than M given by reduction, right? So those are the maps. Now, consider the field extension of Q given by taking Q and adjoining all the primitive P to the nth roots of unity to Q. We'll call that extension Q adjoin mu sub P to the infinity in Q bar, okay? By restriction of maps, this extension gives me a surjective map labeled G sub Q to G sub Q sub P. So G sub Q sub P is just the Galois group of this extension here. Okay, but I know what the Galois group of this extension is by number theory. The Galois group of this extension is actually ZP cross. And so if you follow this surjection by that isomorphism, you get a natural map from GQ to ZP cross, which we call the p adic cyclotomic character of G sub Q written chi sub P. And what does it do? It sends sigma in the Galois group to some sequence of elements in ZP cross, say M1, M2, and so on. How are these MIs or these MNs defined? <clears throat> well, they're defined in the following way. If you act on a primitive P to the nth root of unity, mu sub P to the n by sigma in G sub Q, you get mu sub P to the n to the power M sub n for all n. So that's how the M sub n's are defined, okay? This is easily seen to be a continuous map, group homomorphism. So it's definitely a one-dimensional Galois representation, all right? Now on to some of the generic properties of Galois representations we'll need. So first of all, if I give you a global Galois representation rho from GQ to GL2 of A, remember the Galois groups G sub Q sub L, which we call the decomposition groups at each prime L, are, the, are by definition the Galois groups of Q bar L over Q L. And we saw last video that these sort of naturally inject into G sub Q, and so we can view them as subgroups of G sub Q. Well, that means you can take rho and you can restrict rho to each of the decomposition groups, G sub Q sub L. That allows you to obtain a family of what we call local Galois representations, rho sub Q sub L or just rho sub L, from G sub Q sub L, the decomposition group at L, to GL2 of A. Okay, so this slide is a bit of a hodgepodge. So on to the next separate definition. We say rho, a Galois representation is odd if debt of rho of C is negative one, where C is complex conjugation. Remember, in GQ, there's only a couple elements you can really concretely write down. The identity and complex conjugation are among them. Okay, oops, I wrote them in the wrong spot. Okay, so you can take complex conjugation here, send it somewhere, and then follow this map up with the determinant map. And if the result is negative one, we're gonna call rho an odd representation. As a quick example slash exercise, it's easy to see that cyclotomic characters are odd, for example, all right? Now, inertia. So if you take a prime L that isn't infinity, it's easy to show that the Galois group at L preserves the ring of integers Z bar L in Q bar L. And it also preserves the unique maximal ideal lambda in Z bar L. So this is a local ring, so there's a unique maximal ideal lambda. Okay, the Galois group at L preserves that maximal ideal. Another way of saying this is that the decomposition group at L just acts on the residue field, which I'll call F bar sub L, which is Z bar sub L mod lambda. Okay, well, this gives me a natural map from the decomposition group at L to the Galois group of F bar L over F L, okay? 
And you can easily check this map is surjective. So you're interested in the kernel every time you have a, a surjective homomorphism of groups, right? This kernel I sub L is called the inertia group at L. And so one way of summarizing this slide is there's a natural exact sequence one to I sub L to the decomposition group at L to the Galois group of F bar L over F L. So like this residual Galois group to one. In other words, this group is GQL mod I L. Okay. So this leads naturally to the concept of ramification. Give me a Galois representation rho. Give me a prime L. I will say rho is unramified at L if the inertia at L is in the kernel of the local representation at L. That is, if rho factors through the Galois group of an extension of Q unramified at L, or very, in a, very enlighteningly, another equivalent way of saying this is that rho locally at L factors through the residual Galois group at L, the Galois group of F bar L over F L. Okay, so who cares about, why do we care about unramified primes? Well. We have the concept of Frobenius, right? So this residual Galois group is topologically, it's a topological cyclic group and it's generated by L power Frobenius, the L power Frobenius automorphism that sends X to X to the L power, right? So this is abstract algebra Galois theory class. Now, so when rho is unramified at L, I can sort of view it as a map from this residual group to GL2 of A, right? Well, that means the representation is determined by where it sends this elf power Frobenius automorphism because this is a cyclic group, you see. Okay, so, so at L, so rho sub Q sub L is a homomorphism from this group to GL2 of A. So at L, rho is determined by where it sends this automorphism, you see. But you have an isomorphism of this residual group with GQL mod IL, right? Okay, so this Frobenius automorphism pulls back to something here, but then you have the natural projection map from GQL to GQL mod IL, right? And so what am I saying? I'm saying it's great for a representation row to be unramified at L because then locally at L, the representation is completely determined by where it sends a representative, let's call it Frob sub L and G sub Q sub L, okay? So Frob sub L again is not this map. It's a representative of this map in GQL under the maps I just described, okay? Now these Frobenius elements in GQL, they're only defined up to conjugation because we made choices of embeddings last video. G sub Q sub L injects into G sub Q. And what you're interested in is you wanna know how to view a, a Frobenius at L as an element living in here, the global Galois group. Well, it turns out that Frobenius is actually a conjugacy class of elements living in GQ, okay? So we will abuse notation and language frequently, and we'll just say Frobenius at let, you know, let Frob L be a Frobenius at L. But what we really mean if we're viewing that as living in GQ is let Frob L be a conjugacy class of a Frobenius element living in GQ. Okay, how do you take a Frobenius of a prime in a number field? So let's let P be an ordinary prime, and let's let F over Q be a Galois number. For a prime frac P of the ring of integers OF of F lying over P, the decomposition group of frac P is written D sub frac P, and it's the set of all sigma in the Galois group of F over Q that fix frac P setwise. So this notation here means sigma acting on frac P. Now this is easily seen to act on the residue field kappa sub frac P, which is O sub F mod frac P, in the following way. It acts on a coset X plus frac P by, uh, with sigma, by just acting on a rep, the representative of that coset X, okay? Well, we have an action. So the kernel of this action is what we call the inertia group of frac P, I sub frac P. So it's the set of all sigma and the decomposition group of frac P that act residually trivially. In other words, such that sigma of X is just X mod frac P for all X in the ring of integers O sub F, okay? As you might expect, given the, the theory of inertia at ordinary primes, there is an isomorphism from the decomposition group of frac P mod inertia at frac P to the Galois group of kappa sub frac P over FP. So this residual Galois group, just like we had above, right? And it's also something you can check. I mean, I sub frac P, so inertia is trivial if and only if P is unramified in F field theoretically. So it's, it doesn't split into primes that repeat themselves. Okay, now this right-hand group here, 
is generated by the Frobenius automorphism, sigma sub p, the pth power Frobenius automorphism, right? Okay, look, so you have pth power Frobenius here. You can pull that back to something in D subfract P mod I subfract P, and then you can pull whatever that element is back to DP, D subfract P by taking a representative of whatever coset, okay? That's called a Frobenius element of the Galois group of F over Q, and it's written frob subfract P. Now, if you change the prime frac P over little p, you might get a different element back here in D subfract P, right? But the point is, again, to nobody's surprise, although this has to be checked, if you change frac P, you actually end up conjugating Frobenius at frac P by some element sigma in the Galois group of F over Q. So when I say a Frobenius element frob subfract P, again, what I mean is a conjugacy class of elements in the decomposition group of P, all right? So, um, so example, let's go back to the cyclotomic character. Uh, fix a prime P and then give me a prime L. Look at the L-adic cyclotomic character chi sub L evaluated at frob sub frac P, where frac P is a prime lying over P. It turns out you will get P if P isn't L. And this is independent of how both frac P and frob sub frac P are chosen, okay? And so from this, you can see that the L-adic cyclotomic character has infinite image. And it's characterized by the property that sigma of zeta is zeta to the chi sub L of sigma for any L power root of unity zeta and any sigma in the Galois group of Q. For more information on the cyclotomic character, I would see Diamond and Sherman chapter nine. Okay. How about the determinant of a Galois representation? Let's let A be a coefficient ring. Let's let P denote the characteristic of the residue field K sub A of A. It's easy to see. There's a unique continuous ring map from ZP to A. Here's the map. You know there's a natural ring map of Z to A from algebra class, right? But the ideal, take the ideals generated by P to the N, right? Those ideals map to the ideals P to the NA, right? Well, that means I have mapped Z mod P to the NZ to A mod P to the NA. Okay, these maps are compatible and so they yield a morphism of projective systems. And so they yield, in other words, they yield a morphism between the in inverse limits of these guys. Okay. But the inverse limit of Z mod P over N of the Z mod P to the NZs is just a ZP, right? And A is a coefficient ring. So remember, part of the definition is that it's P complete. And so the, defini the, the inverse limit over N of A mod P to the NA is just A, actually, because A is already complete. That's my natural map from ZP to A. Okay. Now, I have a natural ring map from ZP to A, right? So that gives me a canonical group homomorphism, which I'll call U. Uh, between the groups of units, so from ZP cross to A cross. And so I'm going to say that a Galois representation rho from GQ to GL2 of A has determinant chi sub P, or has p adic cyclotomic determinant, if det rho is U compose chi sub P, the p adic cyclotomic character. So again, let's just write this out. So you have rho from G, you have rho from GQ to GL2 of A, right? And then you can take the determinant, which gives you a map to A cross, you see. But then you also have the p adic cyclotomic character going from GQ to ZP cross. And then you have this natural map U here. So if this composition is just the same as debt, we're going to say rho has cyclotomic determinant. Okay. The last thing we're going to have to talk about is a flatness of a Galois representation. For this, you really need to know your algebraic geometry. This isn't going to, I'm not going to talk extensively about algebraic geometry because it's just hard to develop the theory from scratch. I'll give you a key definition here. And maybe later on my channel, I'll do full courses on algebraic geometry. But a locally ring space is a topological space endowed with what we call a sheaf of rings. Although to actually be a locally ring space, you need to make sure the stocks are local rings too, but whatever. What's a sheaf? You should think of a sheaf as an object which nicely describes all the functions on each open set of the given topological space. So for example, if I give you a commutative ring A, then spec A, the set of prime ideals of A, the spectrum of A, that's a locally ring space. Uh, it's, the topology is given by the following. The closed sets are of the form V of I, which is the set of prime ideals in spec A containing I. So you can check that forms a topology on spec A. There's a risky topology, okay? Uh, I here in I, A is just an ideal. Now, I won't tell you what all the functions are on all the open sets of the space, but I'll tell you what the global functions are on the entirety of spec A. It turns out those are just the ring A itself, okay? 
So what's a scheme? An affine scheme is a locally ringed space, which is isomorphic to spec A for some commutative ring A. And then a scheme is a locally ringed space covered by affine schemes, okay? Another definition that we'll need is, what does it mean for a scheme, let's say T to be an S scheme, where S is a scheme, it means take a scheme S, another scheme T is called an S scheme, if there's a map of schemes from T to S. What's a map of schemes? It's a continuous map of topological spaces that has a pullback of functions, okay? So flatness, we say a Galois representation row from GQ to GL2 of A is flat at P. If for every ideal I and A, a finite index, the representation at P, so the local representation G sub Q sub P to GL2 of A mod I obtained in the obvious way. So just take the local representation and then follow it up with the entry-wise reduction map mod i. So we're going to say we're flat at p if that map extends to what we call a finite flat group zp scheme. So finite flatness of a scheme will be talked about in chapter five. I won't define that here. Just think about finite flat schemes as very special schemes. A zp scheme is a scheme that is a spec z of p scheme. So there should be a natural map. Let's say g is your finite flat group scheme. What it means to be a ZP scheme is there's a natural structure map from G to spec ZP, okay? And then what does it mean to be a group scheme? All you need to know for now until we get to chapter five later is that it's like a scheme with a group structure on it, okay? So all this again will be explained in more detail in chapters five and 13, but just think of it as a, a, a ZP scheme that's a group and it's got some special nice properties, okay? And also I will give you an easier to digest slightly uh, version of this definition. Once I write down some specific examples of Galois representations, like those attached to elliptic curves, to which I wanna apply this definition. The definition will clean up a little bit when we specify. Okay, so next video, we will start looking at Galois representations attached to elliptic curves. So basically we'll need three major types of Galois representations, though the cyclotomic character, those attached to elliptic curves, and those attached to cusp forms. And so we'll look at elliptic curves next time. So thanks for watching and I'll see you then.